This continuation of my story about the worst and also best job I ever had begins with me waking up early in the evening and immediately crying out in agony. I felt like a rotten patch of roadkill that was beaten up with a stick. My back, legs, shoulders, and arms were screaming, and everything else was quietly sobbing in distress. On top of all the muscle pulls and strains, my palms were stinging like a mad bastard from the numerous blisters that had popped while I'd been sleeping. There's a damn good reason why you see one person digging and four others standing around while you drive past a road crew. It's not because the rest of them are a bunch of lazy bastards, it's because several people need to take turns on the shovel. Digging large holes is very hard fucking work. If that worker on the shovel was the only one digging all day, they'd, well, they would end up like me the next morning, oozing out of bed with a string of curses on my lips and a grimace of pain on my face. I lurched into the shower and let the water beat down on my aching flesh until it started to run cold. After I got dressed, I popped some Tylenol, crawled onto the couch, and prayed I'd either start to feel better or simply die and be released from my suffering. After a while, the agony receded a bit, and I didn't pass away, leaving me no choice but to haul my poor carcass off the couch and go to work. The guards at the entrance seemed especially hostile that evening. I could almost taste their pent-up aggression in the air. As I limped through the big double doors, one of them said, Kind of surprised to see you, kid. Didn't think you'd be coming back. I grimly ignored him and made my way across the wide, empty expanse of the lobby. Kaz was already waiting at the service entrance, a heavy steel door that was marked exit to keep the guests from getting curious about what was on the other side. I checked my watch and shook my head at him in irritation. Man, do you friggin' live here or something? God, almost 25 minutes early. You're already suited up. Kaz ignored my grumpy acquisition and quietly said, I'll tell you something, boy. I did not know if I would see you tonight, or any other night for that matter. I know when a man has murder in his heart. Len fondly wished to kill you last night. Whatever you did to make him so angry, you should probably not do it again. And I leaned closer and lowered my voice to a whisper. Problems disappeared, don't worry. It's done. Kaz gazed down at me with a mildly benign expression and said, I was not worried. I just did not expect you to still be alive. I rolled my eyes and stormed off to get changed. Without the extra layer of chainmail, the safety gear consisted of a bodysuit made from a thin layer of Kevlar, knee-high leather boots, and a pair of close-fitted leather gauntlets. Once I struggled and shoved myself into these uncomfortable items of apparel, the next step was to strap on the awkward, ridiculous-looking utility belt. This snappy ensemble was complete with a thick silver chain around my neck, and a squirt gun full of silver nitrate in a hip holster. I was ready to go wrangle the undead. The first task on hand was to check on Catherine, the ghost, who was keeping herself amused by engaging in creepy ghost activities. Most specifically, she was creaking back and forth in a rocking chair with her severed head in her lap. I tucked away my mirror and groaned. I can't do it, man. I, I can't look at her. It's too sad and gross. It fucked up. Who did that to her? Kaz shrugged and said, No one knows. He was suspected that her father had killed her in a fit of rage, but it could not be proven. He moved his family to a different town soon after the funeral. It's likely he was afraid of vigilante justice. Can you imagine being this kid's mom? I muttered. Stuck living with this guy after he killed your daughter? If I was her, I would have got him pissed drunk, shoved him down the stairs. I I'd just tell everyone I found him that way. Fuck it. Kaz ventured. Well, probably she did exactly that. He gave me a non-committal shrug. Or perhaps she was also involved in her daughter's murder. Who knows? The truth has been buried by the passage of time. I grimaced and said, May have been a long time ago. That doesn't somehow make it better. Kaz shrugged again. Maybe not. But what can you do? You cannot lament the fate of the dead forever. You must focus on the present. I have hope for the future. You see? I snapped. That's all fine and dandy if you're not the one carrying your head around like a freaking jack-o'-lantern. Probably has a different perspective. I thought about what I just said and added, uh, no pun intended, just, you know. Fair enough. 
Kaz said briskly, and he nudged me along the corridor. You will not stop at Salvatore's habitat tonight. I think it's best for you to avoid him for now. I shook my head and grunted. No, I want to talk to him. I have a few questions for that guy. Kaz gave me a slight ghost of a smile and quietly murmured, Do you not remember the story of foolish Olaf? You are perilously close to milking the bull. Those who milk the bull are often sent to an early grave. His tone was mild, but Casimir's gaze was sharp as a knife. I was in a darkly foul mood, but uh, that look in his eyes, it wasn't something to fuck with. I looked at the floor and muttered, point taken. Kaz nodded approvingly and clapped me on the shoulder, which made me wince and let out a low groan. He said, come along, I'll show you the skinwalker. I gave him the side eye and muttered, what's a skinwalker? That sounds bad. Oh, it is, he agreed. Come and see. The door to the skinwalker's habitat was labeled skinwalker, male, age, unknown. Someone with a rudimentary sense of humor had slapped a sticker on the door below that that read, Welcome to Arizona, the Grand Canyon State. I peeked through the observation window and squinted into the dim moonlight on the other side of the glass. I could see a silhouette of a small, rounded structure in the middle of the room. The floor appeared to be covered with a layer of hard-packed dirt and stones. I couldn't see anything overtly ominous happening in there but a chill walked its cold fingers down my spine nonetheless. It's hard to explain, but there was a silvery tint in the pallid moonlight that didn't quite belong. It reminded me of those old stereoscopic images from Victorian times. It was... well... it was fucking weird. It made me feel uneasy. Something wasn't right in there, no doubt about it. I felt a light tap on my shoulder and I flinched. I whirled around and snarled, Can you maybe not do that? Kaz looked down at me with his standard non-expression and said, You're far too nervous. You must learn to be calm. I closed my eyes and rubbed my temples. I'm starting to get a monster headache. I sighed, No, no, I'm perfectly calm, see? Look, I'm the calmest man alive. So, what's in there? And how... Will it kill me? Kaz proceeded to launch into lecture mode. He clasped his hands behind his back and said, He was once a Navajo holy man, but he made a pact with the forces of evil in exchange for his remarkable abilities. He can change shape at will and adopt the likeness of any number of creatures from the natural world. He is no longer a mortal man. I raised my eyebrows. Yeah, that does sound bad. Where is the guy? Is he sleeping in that mud hut thingy? I mean, it's the middle of the night and all, right? That's a Hogan. It's a traditional Navajo house, but no. Falling Sky does not sleep. He says he forgot how to sleep many years ago. Despite the fact that I was feeling like a pile of moldy garbage, my natural curiosity was piqued. I asked, his name is Falling Sky? The dude's probably like a huge dick or whatever, but still, that's, uh, that's a pretty fucking cool name. He has many identities, Kaz said with a wry smile. He's lived many lives. He's very old, this one. Kaz punched the code in and motioned at the open door. I let out a nervous chuckle and asked, So, what are we actually supposed to do in there? The uh, sweep the dirt around? Kaz motioned at the door impatiently and said, he is an intelligent being, and he was once a mortal man. He craves interaction with his own kind. You go in, say hello, ask if he wishes for some company this evening. I lingered at the threshold and started searching through the compartments of my utility belt. I asked, uh, what, what do I use to keep this dude from killing me? Will the silver nitrate back him up? There's like uh, some dried up roots or something in the, in the pocket here. I Cash shook his head. None of that would protect you. But do not worry. Falling sky will not harm you. He does not dare. Victor knows his true name. If Victor were to speak his true name out loud, it would destroy him. I gave him an incredulous look and exclaimed, Fucking... What? Who is he? Rumble Stiltskin? That's just kind of ludicrous, man. Ludicrous or not, it is the only thing that prevents him from leaving, Kaz grunted. It is also the only thing that prevents him from tearing us limb from limb. 
Stop wasting time. Go in. We still have many other things to attend to this night. I grumbled to myself and stepped into the silvery moonlight. Kaz immediately swung the steel door shut behind me. I took a few steps into the arid plains setting and called out. Hello? Uh, hey, I'm, uh... uh I'm the new caretaker's assistant. Feel like talking to somebody or, you know, I... I just, like, leave. Or, uh... I trailed off. No one answered me. I blinked around me, adjusting my eyes to the dim lighting. There was only one structure inside the habitat, a small dome-shaped building with a stone foundation. The roof appeared to be made from sun-baked mixtures of mud, gravel, and sticks. There was a fire pit beside the building with a couple logs for benches and precious little else. They called out, Hello! Once again, and then my eyes were drawn to a rapid blur of movement approaching my feet. I was being charged by an enormous scorpion. The fucking thing was almost as long as my hand. I screeched, holy shit! I leaped away in a shuffling backwards dance, my arms flailing in the air. At the same time, there was a dull flash of silvery light, and suddenly... I was looking at a tall, weathered-looking Navajo man. The falling sky was bare-chested, clad in only a pair of homespun cotton pants and a pair of low-cut moccasins on his feet. His hair was tied back with a thin strip of leather, and his wiry torso was covered in dozens of old and faded scars. My first coherent thoughts were, well, this fucking guy's been through some shit. He laughed at my shocked expression and boomed. Little brother, I apologize for scaring you like that. Forgot I was a scorpion. Hey, no problem. I said faintly. It happens. Sometimes. The skinwalker grinned down at me and said, I wouldn't mind some company for a spell. Why not? Here. Have a seat by the fire. The pile of dead branches in the fire pit suddenly erupted into a crackling blaze, illuminating the immediate area in a flickering glow of orange and red. I slowly walked over to the fire, getting ready to spin around and run like hell for the door at the first sign of fuckery. Falling Sky held up his hands and said, I won't hurt you, little brother. Not tonight. Would you like some tea? I abruptly realized it was a kettle bubbling away over the fire. I stared down at it and said, That depends, I guess, what kind of tea? He grinned at me again and croaked, The kind that will open your mind to the spirit world. At that point, I abruptly realized that Falling Sky was higher than a kite. I mean, I could, I could see in the light of the fire that his eyes were glassy and his pupils were dilated. He had a vaguely confused expression on his face, but his lips... His lips kept twitching upward into a maniacal smile. I knew that looked very well from personal experience. Falling Sky was tripping balls on some kind of hallucinogen. I shook my head and said, oh, no, thanks, I, I probably shouldn't do that sort of thing on the job. Your boss is over there. He did it once. The skinwalker confided in a hushed tone. He drank some tea and told me his entire life story. He said he couldn't see the spirits, but I think he was lying to himself. I raised my eyebrows and said, No shit. Kaz? Falling Sky let out a high-pitched giggle and clapped his hands together. There's many things you don't know about your boss, little brother. Are you sure you don't want any tea? The veil will be lifted between you and the spirit world. It's a powerful medicine. You should try it sometime. He suddenly gave me a sharp look and growled. Do you know it? I blinked at him in confusion and asked, Know what? My true name. Do you know it? Oh, uh... Uh, no. I stammered. Not at all. I, I didn't even know you existed until a few minutes ago. Falling Sky relaxed back onto his log. He looked up at the skylight high above our heads and muttered, I die a thousand deaths. Carve my name out of his brain. But I only have one life to give. Do you know how old I am? I shook my head and he whispered, Me neither. I don't even know anymore. So many years have slipped away, and 
now they're gone. Falling Sky scooped up a handful of coarse, sandy earth and let it trickle through his fingers. With his other hand, he took a delicate sip from a thin mug and grimaced. He said, Good medicine, but it tastes like horse shit. In a more somber tone, he added, The spirits are saying that you were touched by the Fae. They're watching you. You should be very careful, little brother. Their kind are from beyond this world. They come from somewhere high above. He gestured at the skylight with his free hand. I'll take you away, he sighed. Far away from this world. And once you're gone, you can't come back. I stared at him with my mouth hanging open. How could he possibly know that? I carefully studied the empty air around us and asked, Are the spirits here with us? Right now? What are they doing? Not much. Falling sky chuckled. They just drift around and observe. Their time of trials and tribulations is over. Now they're blessed to be idle in the next world. I thought about it for a second and then said, Okay, that actually does sound pretty sweet. Something flickered behind the skinwalker's goony grin, and his expressions abruptly went dark. He leaned closer and hissed, I will never walk among my ancestors. When my time comes, I'll be destroyed in both body and spirit. It's the price I paid to cheat death. Slowly, I asked, So, let, let me see if I understand the situation correctly, okay? Um, there's something that you, like, you just kind of signed up for? Like, you weren't always a skinwalker, right? You you went and you made a deal with some dude or whatever. And they... They let you into the club. Falling Sky gawked at me with those wide, dilated eyes for a few moments. Then he threw his head back and laughed, quite literally, like a loon. He slapped his knee and wheezed, You could say that, sure. I voluntarily signed up to join... <laughs> to join the Skinwalker Club. Falling Sky's expression became somber. He looked into the fire and said, I did it because I wanted vengeance. I thought I'd allow myself to be destroyed when I was done, but after... after I finally got my revenge. Ah. I don't... I don't know. I guess I just... didn't want to stop. He nodded to himself thoughtfully, still staring into the fire. His eyes were... haunting. It feels good to be powerful, he whispered feels good to wear the skin of the mountain lion, to live as they live beneath the blue sky. There's no future, just here and now. I've killed and I've eaten men, many of them. And you know what? It wasn't a crime. It wasn't murder. If you understand what I mean, I was just eating. And all living things must eat. When I was wearing the skin of another creature, I was pure. I was at one with the world of wolf and deer, fish and fowl, and I was free. I miss those days, little brother. I miss them with all my heart. The skinwalker continued to stare into the fire. The weathered plains of his face were a roadmap of grief, longing, and regret by the dancing light of the fire. I shifted around uncomfortably on my log and clutched my silver necklace. I didn't have to be a mind reader to feel the potential for unpredictable violence 
in the skinwalker's inner turmoil. I lifted it up for him to see and murmured, Sorry to interrupt, but... Does this thing... You know... Will it protect me from you? Because I... Seriously... Fucking hope so. I don't like it much, he admitted grudgingly. And that silver nitrate crap stings like a bastard. But none of that stuff could stop me from killing you, if that's what I wanted to do. The big boss... He's the one who stops me from killing you. If he speaks my name, I will be destroyed. Don't get the wrong impression. I would welcome the end if it meant I could finally join the ancestors. But I can't do that. If I died, I would simply disappear. Now be honest, little brother. That scares me. There are many brave souls out there who aren't afraid to die. But I believe everyone is scared to not exist. That's why the gods exist. People need to believe there is more after death. But they cannot bear to continue. It's the point of suffering life if there is no reward. I thought of Salvador, and I countered, well, most of us are scared of not existing, but maybe not everyone. And listen, this was enlightening, but I, I gotta go. Me and Kaz have a lot of stuff to do. Tell your boss the dead are still following him. Falling Sky said casually. They'll be waiting for him in the spirit world. I didn't know what to say to that, so I just gave him a slight nod and headed for the door. I turned to look back as I left, and I saw that he had silently turned into an enormous wolf while my back was turned. He watched me with hungry eyes, no doubt longing for the days when he destroyed his enemies with a head full of psychedelics and an entourage of all-knowing spirits. Falling Sky had once been the scourge of the Great Plains, an elemental force who has transcended the line between human and animal, mortal and spirit. He had been truly free of mortal or societal constraints in a manner I could never truly understand. Now, don't get me wrong, Falling Sky was obviously a freaking psycho. He scared me pretty badly. But I have to admit, I was kind of jealous of him, too. I mean, who wouldn't want to soar like an eagle, race like a wolf in the moonlight? If you say not me, well, I'm sorry, but I call bullshit. You're a fucking liar. Anyone would want that. Anyone and everyone. The call of the wild is encoded in our genetic memory. We come from the world of wolf and deer, fish and fowl. And when our civilization has crumbled and the cities lay in ruin, we have no choice but to return. When the hydraulic door bolts had finished noisily clunking into place behind me, I turned to Kaz and said, That was the weirdest conversation. That guy's whacked out of his noodle in there. Kaz smiled a little and replied, Peyote and Jimson weed. He says it's how he communicates with the spirits. Yeah, I said reluctantly. About that. He told me to, uh, to tell you something. Kaz's smile faded a bit and he said, Yes? What is it? I grunted. Uh, well, he, uh... He's had to tell you that the dead are still following you, and that they're waiting for you on the other side. Casimir's face went stony, and he looked away from the unspoken question in his eyes. He said, I suspected as much, but what is done cannot be undone. There's nothing more I can do. He started marching away down the service tunnel, and I hurried to catch up. I wanted to ask Kaz what the skinwalker was talking about, but his grim expression forbade any more questions. As we approached the next door, Kaz turned to me and flatly stated, We do not enter this habitat unless it is an emergency. It is not safe to do so under any circumstance. The plate on the door was engraved with one word. Succubus. 
The observation window was obscured with a heavy green shade. I gave it an inquiring look, and Kaz said, It is a safety precaution. You are not supposed to look inside. I snorted. What, you can't even look inside the habitat? What, what about the guests? Do they just take Vic's word for it? Is he like, yeah, I got a succubus in there, but you can't even look at it because she's too scary. I mean, <laughs> why is she even here? Casimir frowned a little and said, The succubus is not an exhibit. She's been contained because she once crossed Victor many years ago. I advise you not to look inside. There is a reason why it is forbidden. Before he could react, I pulled up the shade and looked inside. The habitat appeared to be a glaring white void, formless, featureless, empty with the exception of a massive four-post bed. It was draped with silken curtains and covered by a red velvet canopy. Miss Dahlia was laying on the bed with her head propped up by a heap of satin pillows. She appeared to be wearing nothing but a few strips of lacy material and a knowing smirk on her lips. The intercom was off, but as her lips moved, I could hear her voice in my mind. She said, Come on in here, sugar. I know exactly what you need. I stared at her without blinking, mesmerized as she slowly rolled over onto her stomach. She looked back at me over her shoulder and cooed, What are you waiting for? A written invitation? Come on in. I wasn't aware I was punching in the door code until Kaz tore me away from the keypad and dragged me across the tunnel. I was in a daze and hardly even knew what was going on. It was like being awakened from a deep sleep by suddenly being pinned against a wall by a heavily muscled forearm across the chest. I tried like hell to struggle free, but I'll tell you something. The Casimir fellow was a pretty fucking strong dude. I gave up after a few seconds and gasped, what the, f what the fuck are you doing, dickhead? Let go of me! Welcome back to reality, he said patiently. If I did not stop you from entering that habitat, you'd be dying right now, this very moment. You almost died because you did not listen. If this happens again, I promise you, I will walk away and leave you to your fate. Kaz let go of me with a vague look of disgust on his face, and I straightened up my uniform with a sharp, angry movement. I was mad, but only because... because... he was right. No one wants to admit that they're being kind of an idiot. It's a tough pill to swallow. Kaz pulled the shade across the window and canceled the entry code. He said... Nefertiti is easily one of the most dangerous exhibits in this entire building. She knows all your secret longings and fantasies. Money, lust, power. She knows all your desires. I sighed. But from my vantage point, things were looking pretty good in there. You know, you know what I'm saying? But what would have happened if you didn't stop me? Nefertiti would have devoured you, Kaz answered bluntly. Mind, body, and soul. There would be nothing left but your clothes. In a hushed tone, I said, Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't want that to happen. Casimir added, The succubus seems to have a special fondness for young men. Perhaps it is because you lack both brain power and self-control. I gave him the side eye and grunted, eh, Yeah, perhaps. I just, you know, like... I looked in there and saw, I don't want to even know. Kaz interjected, keep it to yourself. I felt my face go red and sputtered. Anyway, long story short, I should also cruise right past this door and never go in. Gotcha. What? What's even in there? Death. That room has not been entered since the day she arrived. No one goes in there unless you are attempting a rescue. If you are... Fortunate, you may catch her before she begins to feed. If she is already occupied, you can use the silver nitrate to drive her away. Do not look her in the eye. Stay engaged with reality. Sing to yourself. Count backwards from a hundred. Recite poetry. Yell, scream, do anything you can to keep her out of your head. It is your only hope. I let out a sarcastic laugh. <laughs> you, know, you know, sometimes I start thinking maybe that 27 bucks an hour isn't worth it. 
Then I remember what it's like to be broke. Kaz raised an eyebrow. You're only getting $27 an hour. The other assistants are all paid 30 an hour. I let out a harsh laugh and said, ha, Oh, nice. Yeah, that sounds about right. Kaz looked at his watch and said, ah, Let's go to the gazebo and take a break. I need a cigarette. I rubbed my aching shoulders and mumbled, I think I need one too. Not even smoke. <laughs> Come on, big guy. Let's go. The night had rapidly become dark, cloudy, and oppressively humid. The forecast had promised a band of violent thunderstorms to come racing through at some point overnight. If the pathways hadn't been illuminated by decorative lampposts, I wouldn't have been able to see my hand in front of my face. We sat down on the gazebo beneath the willow tree. The thick of the starless gloom held at bay by a series of cheerful globe lights mounted in the ceiling. Kaz fished in his pocket and pulled out his cigarette container. I held up my hand and said, hey, uh, Give me one of those, would you? Never smoked a cigarette before. I see what all the fuss is about. Kaz gave me a disappointed look and reluctantly passed one over. It is very foolish to start at your age, he admonished. And he handed me his lighter. You're old enough to know better. Take it from Casimir. You're better off without it. I muttered, yeah, well, not so sure I'm going to live long enough for it to matter. I spent a few moments puzzling over how to work Casimir's lighter. I got it to light and I dragged cautiously on the cigarette, unsure of what to expect. I'd smoked a metric ton of weed since I was 15 or so, but I had always been leery of cigarettes. Personally, I'd never liked the smell. And beyond that, the smoking pit in high school was a filthy patch of concrete where a bunch of mullet-headed shop kids would gather to spit a lot, talk about a bunch of tough guy talk, beat the almighty fuck out of each other over one petty grievance or another. I, I was quiet. I was bookish kids, you know, who could neither tear apart a carburetor nor take a hard punch and keep swinging back. That wasn't really my scene. I exhaled and said, this shit tastes like fucking garbage. It's gross. I stubbed it out and motioned to Kaz's odd cylindrical lighter, which was still sitting on the table in front of him. Is that an army lighter? You know, the... Whatchamacallit? A field lighter, right? Yes, he agreed quietly. It is. I received it in his service. Kept it in good working order ever since. Tried another puff on the cigarette, but nope. Still fucking awful. Stubbed it in the ashtray beside the table. Cleared my throat. Carefully, I said. The message the Skinwalker told me to pass along. That, uh... Something to do with you... Time in the military? I mean, you don't, you don't have to tell me anything. I just... You know. The look in his face made me trail off mid-sentence. We sat there beneath the forbidding slate of the night sky in silence as Kaz chain-smoked and stared woodenly down at the table. I looked at the displays scattered about the grounds and let him stew for a while. The small circle models of fairy tale castles Peasant farmlands stood out against the dark background, magical islands illuminated by gentle pools of muted light. The effect was cozy and charming, perfect dose of whimsical, wholesome, cleansed the palate of the uncomfortable sights that awaited inside the building. Kaz crushed out another smoldering butt, and without looking up, he said, I've killed many people. Some are soldiers, some are not. Some of these deaths could perhaps be justified. It's all in the past. In the present, I make it a point to live every day the best I can. It is all I can do. I wasn't sure how to respond. As I searched my poor, tired brain for something to say, a pale buck came sauntering out of the darkness and approached the gazebo. He was being followed by a doe, who was also an unearthly shade of pale. They seemed to actually be casting a soft glow of their own as they walked. I could see they dimly lit up the ground beneath them. They drew closer. Kaz glanced at them and said, Ghost, dear. There are several of them who wander the grounds at night. They're gentle creatures. I cannot touch them. I asked why. He shot me a sour look before lighting up yet another cigarette. He exhaled a giant cloud of smoke and growled, 
Are you hard of hearing, boy? They're ghosts. The word ghost is right in the name. The buck poked his massive head over the railing and stared at us for a while, chewing a mouthful of ghostly vegetation as he studied us with docile, milky white eyes. Looking bored and a tad annoyed by the buck's interest in the flesh bags from the world of the living. I asked for the time and noted that we should be headed back soon. Kaz shrugged and started toying with his lighter, flicking the round cap open and shut with his thumb. He said, oh, There's not really much more for us to do in the midnight shift. We're here mostly to sound the alarm if one of these abominations somehow escapes their exhibit. If the weather is fair, I sometimes come out here and take a short nap on a bench. Sit, relax. All is well. The buck circled closer and stared at Kaz with frank fascination. Kaz's lips twitched into a sour smile, and he said, The ghost deer can see the spirits who follow me. I cannot perceive them, but I know they are never far away. They haunt me in my dreams. I took a deep breath and timidly asked, Who's haunting your dreams, Kaz? Who are these supposed spirits that follow you around all the time? Why? He murmured, Every life I've taken. There are many souls waiting for me there. When I go to the outside, they'll take their revenge. I let his words sink in, the full weight of this confession, and I said, Hey man, it was war, right? You... You don't have much of a choice in a war. What are you going to do? You know, convince them, throw down their weapons, arm wrestle for it. Y you did what you had to do. Kaz stared at me with that eerie, non-expression that was his default resting face. I knew he was thinking about his answer. The longer he stared at me, the less confident I felt about the whole thing. I cleared my throat nervously and I repeated, You did what you had to do, right? Finally, he sighed and said, Sometimes yes. Sometimes no. Engaging in combat does not make your cause right or just. You're only doing what you are told to do, and right or wrong is no longer a factor. I've killed many, many people. I was killing the enemy when you were still an infant in the cradle. In the end, all this killing has made no measurable difference in the world. If they were all still alive, the world would not be a better place. Nor would it be any worse. The fighting, the bloodshed, it was all for nothing. I didn't know what to say, so I kept my mouth shut and I waited. The bucket eventually lost interest in Kaz and it swaggered off to the right with a doe. They disappeared, mid-step vanishing into a parallel reality that was everywhere but also nowhere. The world of the dead. Out of the blue, I heard myself blurt out, my pot dealer was wearing a wire, Len made me bury him. Kaz did a double take and demanded, what did you say? You murdered a dealer of pots and buried him with Leonard? I sputtered, no, not a pot dealer, as in like, you know, a dude that sells marijuana to people. Mine got busted by the cops at some point for some heavier shit, so he was wearing a wire. The cops probably heard us talking about Len. Len didn't like that very much, so he killed the fucking guy and made me help you bury him in a cornfield somewhere. That's all I could think about tonight. I never saw a dead person before, you know? I looked into the trunk of the car and he was... Yeah, yeah, he was he was pretty fucking dead. <sighs> Jesus Christ. Kaz gave me a sharp look and said, The police will come looking for him very soon. Tell them nothing. I rubbed my temples and shook my head. That's what Len said, too. He gave me the number for, uh... I was interrupted by a warbling speaker of a muffled siren. Casimir sprang to his feet and breathed, Dear God, that's an escape alarm. One of the habitats has been breached. He took off in a sprint and I struggled to catch up, my legs and back crying out for mercy as I ran after him. I didn't even have time to be afraid of what might be waiting for us in the service tunnel. I just 
pulled out my plastic squirt gun from its holster and ran headlong into danger because... because it was my duty as a caretaker's assistant. It was my job. We burst through the exit door, ready to do battle, but instead of a marauding monster running loose in the tunnel, we found Vic Bonicelli and an unfamiliar man standing in front of the door to the ghost habitat. Vic was furiously punching buttons and swearing up a storm. As we came scrambling over to see what was going on, he turned to us and hollered, What the hell's the door code? I, I got it wrong too many times. Now the alarm's going off. Kaz punched in the correct code, killed the warning siren mid-screech. I looked over at the man beside Vic and realized it was the director I'd seen in Vic's reception room. He seemed to recognize me as well and gave me a wry grin. Mr. Bonicelli put a scare into me, he chuckled. I thought I was about to get killed. Vic grabbed him by the shoulder and exclaimed, Hey, don't you worry about a thing. Oh, Vic's got you covered. <laughs> it won't be a single second, not one single nanosecond, when you and your crew won't be completely protected. Believe me, I know what I'm doing. I worked in the protection racket for years. <laughs> oh, wait, that, that, that's something entirely different, though, ain't it? <laughs> Vic laughed and gripped the clearly uncomfortable director's shoulders a bit tighter. He said, Hey, Kaz, I was looking for you guys. Taking a break, were you? No, 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 don't explain yourself. I get it. When you go out and get some fresh air on a night like this. Real important to keep awake, keep alert. Anyway, this is Mr. McKnight. He's a film director. Mr. McKnight, this is Casimir, one of the caretakers, and his assistant. Good to meet you, gentlemen, McKnight purred soothingly. He flashed us his pearly whites and a disarming grin. You don't mind us poking around while you're working, I hope. Vic interjected. Nah, they don't, they don't mind, right, fellas? Listen, we're going to go now. We're going to see the other exhibits. You take it easy. You be careful with the zombie, right? That thing is disgusting. Vic hustled the director off to the tunnel exit. When they were gone, I turned to Kaz and whispered, What the fuck was that all about? Kaz frowned a bit and answered, I believe Victor might be getting into the film industry. It is not for us to remark upon, however. Come, let us check on the zombie. You can throw him a liver if you'd like. I gave Kaz a probing look and asked, Where do the body parts come from? Do I want to know? No, you do not, Kaz said briskly. Be forewarned, the zombie is a horrid creature, utterly vile in all ways. Come and see. Can't wait, I grunted, and followed him down the hall. Off we went to attend to a walking corpse. A rugged man with a troubled past, and a wide-eyed kid whose time of troubles was just beginning. After work, I stopped at a variety store. And, after some internal debate, I bought a pack of cigarettes. I lit one in the car on the way home and choked half of it down before flicking the other half out of the window. It made my head swim, but I figured I'd get used to it soon. I didn't drink much. Giving up the dope, so shit. You know, I had to have something to calm my nerves. I deserved it, in fact. Someone came walking up behind me as I was opening the door to my building. It was two imposing gentlemen with short hair and collared shirts. At first I thought it was Vic's boys, but then one of them pulled out a badge, and my heart sank. I thought, oh fuck, you guys already? The cop gave me his friendliest smile and said, Hi, I'm Detective Russo, this is Detective Halloran. Do you mind answering a few questions real quick about your pal Vincent? It'll only take a few minutes. I said, I, yeah, I do mind actually, I'm gonna go inside now. You guys have a good day, okay? Bye. He stopped me by grabbing my arm, his smile curled into a grimace. He lowered his voice and said, Hey now, what's your hurry? Don't want to talk to us? I chirped, Nope, not at all. Good day. The detective Russo didn't let go. Instead, he said, You know what? I think I smell weed. What about you, Halloran? You smell that? Yeah, Halloran agreed. I do. I, I think we should detain him and conduct a search. I I you wouldn't find anything, I interrupted. I flushed it all down the toilet a few days ago. I'm on the straight and narrow now. But are you really? Halloran asked patiently. Or did we maybe find something in your lunch bag? I think we probably did. I think it's a little worse than some weed this time. In fact, I think you have at least an ounce of crack cocaine in your lunch bag right now. Probably more. That's some hard time right there, isn't it, Russo? Big boy jail, Russo agreed. Let me ask you something, kid. 
You know how to suck a dick? Because a delicate little fella like you, well, realistically, probably gonna end up giving blowjobs during your stay in federal prison. Probably a lot of them. Russo yanked my lunch bag out of my hand. I kept silent and waited. He pretended to root around and held up a bag of tinfoil wrapped in a baggie. He exclaimed, well, shit. Look at this, Halloran. This looks like a big old bag of rock to me. That's some significant weight right there. Not exactly our main concern at the moment, but I'm sure we could pass it along. What do you think, kid? Should we haul your skinny white ass in for booking, or can you maybe invite us in for a conversation about your friend Vincent? I had known this was coming. And not now, for fuck's sake. Not while I was still sore, shaken up, extremely tired, fresh from watching a zombie massacre a human liver with its 11 remaining teeth. I rubbed my aching eyeballs and said, do whatever you gonna do. I'm not talking to anyone but my lawyer. Sure, Russo smirked. You can call him from the precinct. How's that sound? You're under arrest for possession of a controlled substance with the intent to distribute. Russo read me my rights in a bored monotone as Halloran cuffed my hands behind my back. They took me to the police station and began their song and dance with the paperwork. As soon as I was allowed to use a phone, I called the number I was given by Len, for Vincenzo Papasino, attorney at law. On the second ring, a low, pleasant voice on the other end said, Hello? Vincenzo speaking. Who's this? I tried to keep the quaver of fear out of my voice, but it was nearly impossible. I gasped, Hi, I work for Vic Bonicelli. I need some help over here. I'm at the police station. Say no more, kid, the voice interrupted. I've been expecting to hear from you. Don't worry. Vinny the Pomp is going to take care of this for you, okay? Sit tight. Don't say a word. Literally. Not one word. Be there in 20 minutes. After my phone call, I was taken to an interview room by Halloran and Rousseau. Halloran threw the file folder down on the table and said, You're small potatoes, my man. You're not even on our radar. You could make this all go away. It could happen right now. He's going to talk to us about Vincent. I looked down at the table and said nothing. Russo growled, let me tell you something, kid. The kind of low-rent, piece-of-shit lawyer you can afford, they aren't going to do shit for you. They'll just take your money, tell you to plead down to a lesser charge. We got you red-handed, brother. I suggest you start talking before Lionel Hutz comes in here and totally fucks your chance of walking out a free man. You wouldn't like prison, Halloran added. We mentioned the blowjobs, right? Unless that's your thing. I, I don't know. I don't pass any judgments over here. I'm just saying that you you better be ready to do what you've got to do to get by in there. Rousseau grinned, an unpleasant grin, and said, They have a game in there called Blowing Bubbles. Did you tell her about that? Cellmates cover your head in the toilet and make you sing underwater. Oh, how about this one? Sometimes they'll make you take off your slides, hand them over, right? And they'll beat your ass with your own footwear until you fall down. And if you fall too quickly, they'll stomp on you for real. Make you do it again. Fun times, huh? They hectored me in this fashion for several more minutes, smiling away as they graphically described what would be waiting for me in prison. Exactly 16 minutes after I'd hung up the phone, Vincenzo Pompasino came bursting into the interrogation room. He was five foot seven in his lifted heels, and his faltered pompadour added another solid three inches of crooked, old world ferocity. Both Halloran and Rousseau gaped at him in disbelief. Rousseau groaned, Oh, what the fuck is this shit? Your lawyer is Vinny the Pomp? In the flesh, Detective Dickhead, Vinny added. How's the wife and her boyfriend, Rousseau? You allowed to watch yet? How exactly does the arrangement work? He plopped his suitcase down on the table with an authoritative flunk, then clapped his hands together. Do I have your attention, gentlemen? Good. I just have a quick skim of your arrest report on the way down to the hall, and oh boy, you two are dumber than shit. I'll have this bullshit tossed out quicker than Russo's wife can drop her knickers. Aside from all that legal stuff, I can also release the pictures, if you want me to. Would you like that, Rousseau? <laughs> now, don't feel left out over there, Detective Halloran. Seems to me you've been getting a bit too friendly with the ladies of the night who hang around at Fifth and Regent. I'm pretty sure... I've got a couple dozen pictures or so of that sordid business, too. He patted the briefcase meaningfully and added, How would your mom react, sir? Your kids? The general public? We shouldn't worry too much about your ex, though, right? She already knows about it. 
Uso shoved his chair back from the table, his face red as a brick. He stood up and snapped, You're free to go. Come on, Halloran. And another one bites the dust. Halloran chuckled. Goodbye, gentlemen. See you in the funny pages. As soon as they left, Vinny leaned over to me and whispered, They got this place rigged for sound, so don't say a fucking word. Let's go. Vinny waited until we were outside the precinct before saying anything. When he deemed it safe to talk, he said, Kid, you better thank any deity that'll listen because you should be dead right now. Len must really like you or something, I don't know. All I know is you'd be worm food if Vic found out about any of this shit. Pray he doesn't find out. Vic Bonicelli has ears and eyes all over the place. He's paranoid. And for good reason. I was tired. I thought I might simply pass out from the exhaustion. I yawned and asked, What now? Minnie gave me a cheery grin. Go home, he said. That's what. Catch some Z's. Relax, my friend. You're out of the woods for now. Those two dingleberries won't bother you again, not anytime soon. I asked, What if they do? And Vinny waved off the question with a ring-encrusted hand. He said, if they do, I'll come sauntering in. I'll kick their asses. Don't worry about it, kid. I'm Vinny the Pomp. <laughs> I could eat cops for breakfast and go back for a second helping at lunch. Go home. I watched him drive off in a BMW, his pompadour floating above the headrest in the rear windshield. And I started to laugh. I laughed until I almost cried. Then I hailed a passing taxi. It's time for sleep. And then back for another night of intrigue and misadventures at the zoo. When you're a caretaker's assistant, anything can happen at any time. And it probably will. It's just part of the job, I guess. I mean, every career has its downfalls. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast, and as always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. If you scroll down to the description at the very bottom, you'll find a whole bunch of people there. Also, we've included this nice little scrolling thing, because the number of people who support me on Patreon has gotten so big that I'm afraid it might actually max out the description. So we've, we've included this here as the little scrolling text on the end screens. So everybody on that scrolling text, everybody I'm about to mention right now and mispronounce all of your names and everybody who can donate even $1. Thank you so much. A very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Reaper61167, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Vicky McQuickie, Sam High, Crusader Chocobo, Spooky Shell, Adam Maros, Grand Moth the Milky, Big Smoke369, Captain Scurvy, Salty Irish Poet, Estebot, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Horror Fan1212, Our Minute Second Time, Kyle Resnack, David Martin, Scarrington the Unkempt, Robert Malcolm, Angelus, Spanky, Snoochie Boochie, Seclude, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Merxenum, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Catabaker, Six Gay Rats in a Trenchcoat, Turtle Man, Rob Like Sharp Things, Cryolinian, Xavier Graphius, Lord Life's Best, Goring from Magazine, Maria Walker, Emily Mitchell, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Eka Limchok, Dirt Diver O3 Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Hidden Tiger, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Psychomel, Nana, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Sazaku, Cronut 509, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Benjamin Welverett, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, thank you guys so, so much because you guys help me do everything that I do here. You guys help pay authors for stories and commission stories and do everything that I can do to make this channel and make this podcast the best it could possibly be. So thank you all for supporting me here. And as always, everyone, sweet dreams.